Hello everyone and welcome back to my Warhammer 40k guides. I am Brady and today I have a very special video for you and it's a showcase of the first Psychic Awakening book which is called Phoenix Rising. This book features new rules for Craft Worlds, Drukhari, and Inari and it's available for pre-order currently on the Games Workshop website and it will also be included in the Blood of the Phoenix Rising collection box set which includes the new Drazar and Incubi models for Drakari and also the new Jane Zar model and Howling Banshee models. Also I'm going to be doing this video in three parts or three videos to make the information more easily digestible and so that you only have to watch the parts that you're actually interested in. So this first part is going to be showcasing the new craft world stuff. So like the rules, their new psychic spells and everything that's in this book pretty much. The second part will be for Drukari and the third part will be for the Inari. The Drukari part will be released tomorrow and the Inari part will be released the following day. So I'm going to be working overtime to get these out to you guys and gals in a timely manner. So anyways, with all that said, let's just jump right into it and talk about the craft world parts of this book. So like I mentioned earlier, this is the first book in the Psychic Awakening series. And if all the books in this series are exactly like this one, we can expect to see a ton of new lore, a few new models with updated data sheets, some narrative missions, some new stratagems, new psychic disciplines, and successor chapter type rules for whatever armies they release Psychic Awakening supplements for. So now with all that exposition out of the way, let's get into what you guys and gals clicked on this video for and let's go over some of the stuff that you can find in this new book. I won't be able to cover everything, but I'm definitely going to cover the stuff that I think is either really cool or it's going to be strong or used in competitive play. Because for those of you who don't know and might be watching this video as your first video of mine, I play the game competitively. So that's the perspective that I look at the game from. So like I said in the beginning, this video is about the craft worlds. So let's talk about some craft worlds. So in this video, I will talk about custom craft worlds and how to make your own craft worlds and some of the craft world attributes you can mix and match, the new Jane Czar model and the Howling Banshees, aspect bonuses which are buffs you can give the different Exarchs in your army, and then I'll talk about the new Psychic Discipline. So that's all the stuff you can find in this book alongside narrative missions and a bunch of lore. But I'm going to skip the narrative missions and the lore since that's not really my thing like I said earlier, I'm more about the rules and actually playing the game. So let's start with the custom craft world stuff. The first cool thing that I like that they have in this book is actually not rules related at all, which is kind of surprising. It's a craft world name generator. They have a page of first names and last names to pick from, so you can actually make your own craft world characters, which I actually find really cool. As most of my fans probably know, I like making my own custom armies, such as my Chaos Space Marine Warband, the Red Legion, and I like naming all of my characters to really make my army my own. With this name generator, you can actually make some cool names that are lore friendly, and I think that's really cool and goes very well with the new custom craft worlds you can make, which is also in this book. So let's jump forward a little bit and let's talk about the custom craft world since I just mentioned it. There are 22 different abilities or attributes to pick from to create a custom craft world with, and you get to pick two of them to use as your craft world attributes. You could also, however, pick one of the regular attributes from the Craft World Codex to go for your custom craft world, if you preferred to use one of those instead. The thing is though, if you do decide to use one of the attributes from the Codex while using a custom craft world, as far as I'm aware, you won't get access to the craft world specific stratagems or that craft world's specific characters. For example, if you want to use the Althway trait for your custom craft world army, you wouldn't be able to use Eldrad. So to be honest, if you wanted to use a character like Eldrad with your custom army, I would just play your army as as Althway instead of a custom craft world. Kind of like how I play my Chaos Space Marine Red Legion as either Alpha Legion or Black Legion, since most ITC events won't force you to play your army based on how it's painted. It's more or less just based on if you have the correct models or not, and your paint job is just your own personal take on the army. So I'd say only do a custom craft world rules wise if you want to pick from the list of attributes in the Phoenix Rising book. Otherwise, just play whatever actual craft world you want and you can paint it whatever color you want. So with that said, let's actually talk about a few of the attributes that you can use to make some decent combos. Since again, you can pick two from this list in the book. And again, I'm not going to go over all of them. I'm just going to go over a couple of cool combos that I found that you might want to consider using. The Children of Prophecy attribute. This attribute makes your psychic test rolls of one become rolls of two. This means you're more likely to get those critical spells off that can buff your own units or debuff enemy units. So for this attribute, I could see taking a Supreme Command detachment of Psychers since the Eldar spells can be cast on any craft world so you're not stuck only being able to cast buffs on the same custom craft world as the psychers so you can combine this supreme command detachment which is a custom craft world with something like a lay talk and you can use that custom craft world to buff the lay talk stuff and since you get two traits and not just the one for a custom craft world i would probably combine this with the attribute masters of concealment which gives cover to the units if they are outside of 12 inch range from the enemy units that are trying to shoot them this can be helpful against those pesky space marine snipers who want to kill your characters 
And out of all the other attributes, this is probably the most beneficial. Again, if you're just using a Supreme Command Detachment with Psykers, just to be able to more easily buff up the rest of your army. Another combo that I think is pretty nifty is Hail of Doom, which gives minus one AP to all your shuriken weapons. And I combine this with Martial Citizenry, which allows your Guardian keyword models to reroll hit rolls of one. I think this would work best in a battalion, where you bring a couple of Guardian blobs that deep strike in using the Webway strategy, since they will be rerolling hit rolls of one, and they will have minus one AP on their shuriken catapults. You can bring one unit in on turn two and buff them with Fortune and Celestial Shield, and then you can debuff their target with Doom and Jinx. And with that combo, you're probably going to kill some models while also having a decently durable blob of units. Then turn three, you can bring in a second blob from Deep Strike and repeat the process. Or if you wanted to use other shuriken units, like Shining Spears, you can combine Hail of Doom for the minus one AP on their twin shuriken catapults, plus Masterful Shots, which makes your shooting attacks ignore cover, or Superior Shurikens, which gives four plus inches to the range of your shuriken weapons. So you can shoot a target that's a bit farther away and then charge the closer target. Since if you shoot the closer target, then your opponent is probably just gonna remove models to make your charge more difficult anyways. If you wanted to go a more melee build, you could go with the combo of Headstrong, which gives plus one to your charge rolls, and Savage Blades, which allows your units to reroll hit rolls of one when they charge, get charged, or heroically intervene. And as for these combos that I mentioned, of course you can mix and match them as well. You can bring one detachment that is for the melee stuff, you can bring a second detachment that's for the guardian stuff, and then you can bring a third detachment, which is those psychers in the Supreme Command that I talked about. There's actually a bunch of cool abilities in here, and you could probably come up with some pretty nifty combos based off of the units that you want to play. So it's definitely worth checking out and testing some stuff out with. So that's all I'm going to really talk about for the custom attributes. Like I said earlier though, I'm only going to talk about the stuff that I think can actually be good in the combos that I can see initially. So now let's talk about the new Jane Czar model and the new Howling Banshees. So Jane Czar is 115 points and the Banshees are 9 points per model plus their upgrades. Jane Czar also has an updated data sheet with one new ability that she didn't have before this update. I'll go over everything though just in case you wanted to hear her entire data sheet. So she has an 8 inch movement, weapon skill and ballistic skill of 2 plus, strength and toughness 4, 6 wounds, 4 attacks, leadership 9, and a 2 plus save. She gets ancient doom and battle focus, and has some unique rules like acrobatic, which allows her to charge units that are 15 inches away instead of the normal 12 inches. She can advance and charge, and she gets plus 3 to the charge roll if she advanced. So she really shouldn't have any problem with running up the board behind your units to be led into combat because of her 8 inch movement, plus advance, and the fact that she can advance and charge, and when she does, she gets plus 3 inches to that charge. So she could be in combat by turn 2 if you wanted, or possibly even turn 1 if you cast the quickening on her, but then you're running headfirst into the enemy screen and only killing chaff, so that probably isn't the best option. So because of the plus 3 to your charge, you're most likely never going to fail a charge that's 9 inches away or lower. The thing about charging units that are 15 inches away is cool and all, but realistically, let's say you charge something that's 15 inches away, then you're going to need a 14 inch charge, and even with the plus 3 that you get, that's still an 11 inch charge, so you're most likely not making that. So it could be helpful in those dire situations where you're chasing something down, but more often than not, I think the only useful parts of this ability are the plus 3 inches to the charge distance when you advance, and being able to advance plus charge. Her next ability is called Storm of Silence, and this is the new ability that was added to her data sheet. This ability makes her attack characteristics change based on how many models that are within 2 inches of her after she piles in. This means you could theoretically get around 15-ish attacks if your opponent has a bunch of orcs or something all jumbled together, but realistically probably means you're still only getting around four or five attacks since most players line up their units in a line instead of jumbling them all together. This could be extremely useful though to help her counter charge, because when people charge a unit, they normally pile in all their models to get as many attacks as possible. So on your turn, you can leave combat with whatever unit they charged, if they're still alive, and then you can charge with Jane Czar, and hopefully their unit is still all bunched up, and you might be able to get like 8 plus attacks off with this. So to me, this ability sounds great for counter punching. But it does have counterplay, because if your opponent is smart enough, they can still just kind of line them up instead of bunching them all together, and you're going to be stuck with a around 4 or 5 attacks. Also her next ability is Banshee Mask, which means she ignores Overwatch. So again, in that situation I previously described, once your unit that was charged leaves combat or even dies, Jane can counter charge and not be afraid of getting overwatched to death. So this is also helpful in situations where you want to tie something up so that you can charge with other units like Shining Spears or stuff like that. 
And this ability makes Tao want to cry because it counters for the greater good as well. She has another ability called Cry of the War Unending, which allows her and friendly Howling Banshee units that are within 6 inches of her at the start of the fight phase to always fight first even if they didn't charge. This can be helpful as well if you're playing with Howling Banshees in your list, or it can be useful just for her as well since in most combats she's likely to survive being toughness 4 with 6 wounds and a 2 plus save. The only stuff I can actually see killing her outright in combat in one turn are bigger characters like Gilliman or Abaddon and units like that. On top of that, she has one more ability called War Shout, which minuses one from enemy melee attacks against her, making her even more durable in melee, so she can live and continue to fight in future turns. As for her war gear, she has a spear called the Blade of Destruction, which is a melee weapon that gives her 2 plus strength to make her strength 6. It has minus 3 AP, D3 damage, and it can re-roll failed wounds. This means she'll wound guardsmen on 2's re-rolling, and space marines on 3's re-rolling, so she actually hits decently hard in close combat. And she has a shuriken looking thing, which is assault 4, range 12 inches, strength user, minus 3 AP, and 1 damage. So I like the fact that it's an assault weapon, so it synergizes with her being able to advance every turn, so she can still shoot it, or I guess throw it. It's nothing too amazing, but it's still a bit of extra damage when you start getting in close for that kill. And that's pretty much it for her stats. Overall, I think she's a pretty decent unit. Not an amazing unit, but definitely decent. And I think in certain situations, she could be pretty strong. Also, I like her model too. I think it's gorgeous. Maybe not as gorgeous as the Drizar model because I'm biased, but that's a topic for the next video. So now let's briefly talk about the Howling Banshees. As far as I can see from comparing the Craft Worlds Codex to this book, the Howling Banshees only had minor changes. The Exarch can take some new weapons, which is an Executioner Sword or Mirror Swords, or a Triskeli or Triskel, which is an assault weapon similar to Jane Zars. Other than that, the unit is pretty much the exact same as in the Codex. And although they do come with some cool rules like the plus 3 to their charges and being able to advance and charge, and ignoring Overwatch much like Jane's are, their actual stats aren't that great and they're probably going to die pretty easily if they're running up the board, and they're also kind of expensive compared to other things you can take from the Codex. And they aren't characters like Jane's are, so they can be shot at while running up the board, while only being toughness 3 with a 4 plus save, so they'll die pretty quick. Also, with only being strength 3 with power swords, they won't wound stuff like space marines very well, and they're pretty much reserved to only killing toughness 3 models, but again, the Craft World Codex has other things that do this job a hell of a lot better. So to be honest, I don't see these guys seeing much competitive play at all, and I think these guys are pretty much just reserved for casual play with friends or narrative games with friends. And now with those units out of the way, let's talk about the aspect bonuses. So there are 9 of them, and what they are is that there are a list of abilities that you can pick from to upgrade your Exarchs by replacing one of their current abilities. Each different Exarch has a different list of abilities to choose from. But there are stratagems that come with these bonuses that you can use on the different Exarchs so that you can just gain that extra ability instead of replacing the one that's on their data sheet. You'll see what I mean when I start talking about them. In most situations, I think I'd just replace the ability since it's free and command points are very valuable, but there are a couple of situations which I'll talk about when I get into them where you might want to actually pay the one command point so that you can keep the ability that your Exarch already has. Also, like usual, I'm not going to be going over all of the aspect bonuses, I'm just going to cover the ones that I think are pretty cool or useful in competitive play. The first one I like is called Exemplar of the Reaper Shrine. The ability you get for this replaces the Crack Shot ability on the Exarch, unless you pay one command point to just upgrade it and keep your Crack Shot ability. So the first buff I like from the list of buffs that you can choose from, this gives the entire unit plus 6 inch range to their guns. They already have a pretty long range, but this just means that you can hit even more of the table, so opponents will have a harder time trying to stay out of the Dark Reaper's range with their long range units themselves. And it also allows your Dark Reapers to stay out of range of other things themselves. So like for example, if your opponent has a bunch of like last cannons or stuff that's 48 inches, well now your Dark Reapers don't have to be within that 48 inches to shoot them. They can be outside of it by 6 inches and still shoot them. And the other buff that I like from this list is Reign of Death, which allows your Exarch to re-roll the amount of shots for his Tempest Launcher. This can help with those times when you roll something low, like 3 or 4 shots, and you just basically make your Tempest Launcher more consistent. If you choose the Reign of Death ability though, I might actually consider paying the 1 command point to keep the Crack Shot ability, since re-rolling hit rolls of 1 could be beneficial. The next aspect bonus I like is for Crimson Hunter Exarchs, and it replaces the Marksman Eye ability, which is the ability to re-roll once to hit. I think this is one of those cases where I'd actually want to pay the 1 command point to keep that ability since those re-rolls are very helpful. So there's actually a few bonuses here that I think show potential. The first gives the Exarch a 5 plus invulnerable save. The next one allows it to ignore the penalty for moving and firing heavy weapons, so it always hits on a 2 plus and rerolls ones if you keep that Marksman's Eye ability. Another one of the abilities allows you to reroll wound rolls of one against units that can't fly. 
And a very interesting ability, it allows your Crimson Hunter Exarch to turn 180 degrees instead of 90 degrees when it goes to move since it's a flyer and has to move like that. To be fair though, with their ability to be able to turn after they land as well, I don't think that this is needed, but I did think it was pretty cool, so I mentioned it. Initially, I'm thinking that the hitting on twos and rerolling ones is the best bet, or even possibly going with the hitting on twos and trading that out for the rerolling ones to hit, since you can keep your command points that way, and I think hitting on twos without rerolls is better than hitting on threes while rerolling ones. I could be wrong on that, so if I am, correct me down in the comments, but I think, I, I do think hitting on twos is better. But with that said, I do see uses for all the other ones I mentioned, so that's why I mentioned them. So I guess overall, what this tells me is that Flyer Spam just got a minor buff. And that's it for the aspect bonuses that I like. I'm sure there's probably some other cool ones in there that I didn't mention, but like I said earlier, this is just my initial first impressions, and I haven't had any time to test anything out yet. So take that as you will. The final thing to talk about in this video is the new psychic discipline for craft worlds called Runes of Fortune. This is an interesting discipline, since you replace your smite spell for one of these spells, which is a unique way of getting new spells. So like usual, I'm going to go over the spells that I like, and the ones that I think are the most useful. The first spell is Ghost Walk, and has a warp charge of 6. This spell buffs a friendly unit and gives it plus 2 to its charge roll. This can go extremely well on stuff like Jane Czar or Shining Spears, or really any melee unit. If you do use this on Jane Czar, she gets plus 5 to her charge technically because of her built-in ability if she advances, so that's a nifty little combo. Crushing Orb is another cool spell, and it's Warp Charge 4. That's right, 4. That's pretty easy to get off, especially if you take that Supreme Command Detachment I was talking about with that custom craft world and those traits, because then when you take your Psychic Test, if you roll any 1s, those rolls count as 2, so you literally can't fail this spell. This spell targets an enemy character within 18 inches of the Psyker, and you roll 3 dice. On rolls of 5+, plus, you do 1 mortal wound. This can help chip away at characters to soften them up for snipers like your rangers to finish them off, or even a Dark Reaper Exarch if you take the aspect buff that allows them to shoot at characters. I don't think I mentioned that one, but yeah, that's a thing. Focus Will is another spell that I like. It's Warp Charge 6, and it buffs up a friendly Craft World Psyker within 6 inches, and it gives them plus 2 to deny rolls. This can be extremely good against stuff like Thousand Sun Smite Spam, or even Mirror Matches where Psychic spells can lead to really good combos. And the last spell that I like is Impair Senses. This is Warp Charge 6, and it debuffs an enemy unit so that they can only shoot at their closest enemy unit unless the target that they actually want to shoot at is within 18 inches. This means you can put a bunch of chaff up front to block the enemy unit from shooting what they actually want to, as long as you keep the unit that you think they want to shoot at outside of 18 inches from the enemy unit. Which is possible, because you could move block them with the chaff unit that is going to eventually be shot at by them. So you can debuff a unit like Last Cannon Devastators or something similar, so that they're forced to shoot at your Guardian Blob that's right in front of them, and stuff like that. I don't think this is the most practical spell in the world, but it does have potential and I can see it being used with great efficiency. And that's it for my thoughts on the new Craft World stuff. I went over the stuff that I liked and the stuff that I think we'll see competitive play in the future, and also if I didn't mention it already, I really like how the Jane Czar and Howling Banshee models look. I think Games Workshop did a really good job on those sculpts this time around. So this book is definitely worth picking up if you're a competitive player, and if you're a narrative player, this book is 100% worth picking up, just because you get like that list of names that I talked about for making your own custom craft worlds, you get a bunch of custom missions that are in the book that I didn't really talk about, but I believe there's 6 of them in there, and all the stuff that I didn't talk about, they all seem really cool and fun to play with, so for a narrative player or a casual player that plays craft worlds or Drukari or Inari, this is a perfect book to pick up to help supplement your army. So anyways, let me know your thoughts down in the comments. I still read every comment on my channel, so I'd love to hear what you guys and gals have to say. Also, I will be releasing part 2 of this video tomorrow where I will go over Drukari, and I'm really looking forward to that part, since as most of you may know, I love Drukari, and it's my favorite competitive faction to play. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Following that, I will release the Inari part, and then I'll be releasing my top 10 armies of September, which I know you're all looking forward to. So anyways, if you like this type of content, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more content like this. And also, don't forget to check me out on Patreon if you want to help support the channel even further. Also, check out the channel's sponsor, Bearbox Studios, if you need some painting commission work done. Let them know that Almost Pro Gaming sent you. His link will be in the description of this video. And thanks to all my current patrons for being awesome and helping the channel get to where it's at today. You guys and gals are amazing, and I honestly can't thank you all enough for the support that you've given me and my channel. With that said, thanks to all of you for watching this video, and I will see you in the next one. Happy Wargaming.